Welcome back to the Stir Crazy Podcast. As always, I'm Rob Nelson. And I'm Mike Bakov. And you know, these podcasts are free for everybody, Rob. It's it's almost like we're giving them away for a song. Yeah, they don't even <laughs> uh, charge rent. Ooh, yeah, that, that's more musical than opera, but I think I'll take it because our topic this week is uh, opera houses. And uh, man, we've got some really interesting stuff. I mentioned last week I was coming at this from kind of a zero knowledge base. This is a really interesting one, uh, and I didn't know how interesting it was going to end up being. Yeah, we uh, sit down with Casanova, who's our director of interpretation, and then later we uh, got the chance to discuss the history of the Bartonback Opera House here in Grand Island with none other than George Bartonback, the heir apparent to the Bartonback <laughs> legacy of the Opera House here in town. Yeah, he's a guy who's been around in the community for a long time, and, and the Opera House for years was his art studio and, and framing store. But yeah, I'll be really interested to hear what he what he comes up with in terms of his legacy and, and how he feels about the Bartonback Opera House. Absolutely. So without further ado, let's get into it with our uh, Director of Interpretation, Case Inova. All right. And we're back with more of the Stir Crazy podcast. I am joined today by Kay Sanova, Director of Interpretation here at Stir Museum. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. It's been a little bit. It has, but I, I'm looking forward to this conversation. I, I, I think you and I go down a lot of rabbit holes that maybe don't go down otherwise. Rabbit holes are fun. Yeah, especially historic ones. Oh, yes. As some of our listeners will recall. <laughs> um, today, we're going to be talking about all things Opera House, Barton Back included, but not necessarily limited to. No, it could uh, encompass a lot of different areas. So Yeah. Well, I mean, just in terms of American history, this country has a long history associated with opera houses. Um, to start with, what were these places and what were they used for primarily? Well, they uh, are actually very interesting and they, they would be so many different sizes of variations. They were kind of like public houses where you could go and have any type of entertainment uh, and and the owners of the opera houses would kind of dictate because they're the ones that would sign the talent to come in. And as transportation evolved, you would see the evolution of these troops that would travel from city to city to city uh, to play in these opera houses. You'd see these troops evolve. Uh, at first, they would, you know, travel by wagon to get to some of these. And then as the train became more and more prevalent, they would come by train to, to all these different communities. But you could have anything from a musical to oh, an opera, uh, a lot of comedies. Um, you would also have the local things, lo- local musicals, um, local plays, you know, put on like by um, school kids. Uh, graduations occurred yeah. there. Uh, just musical performances of some way, shape, or form. It kind of was unlimited. So basically, it was the Pinnacle Bank Arena of its time. Pretty much, pretty much. Just, just about anything came and went. It was anything kind of a and community, everything. community yeah. center for mm-hmm. the arts, as it were. Yeah, uh, a, a community would be really fortunate to have a a venue such as that. Uh, I believe the one, uh, the Barton back in particular came about in the 1880s, if yeah. I remember correctly. And uh, it was very popular from the get-go because it's, I mean, there's not a lot to do. Uh, so to have these theatricals and all these different performances actually come to your community where it's it's just a step outside of the everyday rigors of life would be such a treasure. Yeah, one of the things that I I really enjoy about the history of opera houses is that you didn't have to be a a huge burgeoning metropolis to have one. Um, A lot of, you know, towns throughout the Midwest or just across the country in general, a thousand people, 2000 people, 5000 people towns. They have these these opera houses. And yeah, the opera houses might just hold a handful of people, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 people. They wouldn't have to hold hundreds of people in order to be successful. But they still put together great auditoriums for these traveling entertainers that you're talking about. Yeah. Like uh, in 1891, for instance, Carney's uh, Opera House had a seating capacity of 1,200 people. Uh, that was 10% of their, their local population. Red Cloud had a population of 796 people, had an opera house. You know, like the, these size of communities having them, I think, is it kind of puts you on the map. 
Well, and the nice thing about it is it didn't just draw from that community. It would draw from all these surrounding communities. So all these people would know because of advertisement, you know, posters, all these broadsides put up all over the place in uh, newspapers and everything that uh, such a such a presentation was going to be at the Opera House during this week. And they could pick a time and come to town, which is also a boon for the community, because not only you're coming to town for the opera house presentation, but you might also do some shopping while you're in town. Uh, It's kind of like the touristy thing of its period. As much as the opera house, you know, was an entertainment venue, in terms of like the Bartonback Opera House, they had to depend on actual stores to get them by on the during the more lean years. Uh, they had an entire block of storefronts. Like yeah, they had a number of different stores. I I, I remember one in particular was a, a book, uh, kind of a bookstore, and they would sell books and candy. And during the Christmas period, they would also sell uh, toys for Christmas and all of that. Bartonbacks also had uh, their their framing enterprise, which kind of I, I believe it started as a framing enterprise, but it was more kind of like a home decoration type thing. And they were, uh, I mean, it would change all the time, all the different. I think there was uh, four to four or five different slots below the opera house portion itself that they could have stores. Speaking to just kind of the availability of, you know, the opera house is a commodity that everyone could enjoy in a, in a small town Were the productions that took place at these events, you know, were they economical? Could anyone go to them? Well, it, it, it depended because, uh, there were different prices for different times. I found in looking in May 1886, which would be early in uh, the history of Barton Beck Opera House, is you could get a matinee for 25 cents. But uh, if you happen to be seated at a performance in the whatever the porquette is, uh, that would cost you 75 cents. Uh, You could be in the gallery for 30 cents. And there was one situation the same year in January where it only costs you 20 cents to listen to some music, a musical presentation. So it kind of depended upon what the performance was and where you sat within the opera house. Sure. And, you know, like, as you were saying, like that, those forms of entertainment change over time because what we'll see in the turn of the 20th century is the emergence of movie houses. Yes. And, you know, as fate would have it right across the street from Barton Backs in yep. the early 1900s, the Lyric Theater opens mm-hmm. up right across the street. Well, so, of course it's going to open up right across the street because competition. Yeah. But so there, I mean, and, and at that point you see things like um, the Barton Back Opera House hosting boxing matches, hosting much more grander theatrical productions. So it became maybe more of a, like a, a classiest place to attend. They yeah, they try to attract more and more variety and more uh, things that would grab a larger audience that than they might normally get, so that they could stay on top of uh, their costs. And so it varied throughout time, uh, depending upon and and the once the the movie theaters came in to being and they started cropping up like daisies. Uh, that was a huge uh, amount of competition for the opera house and opera houses in the area in general. Beginning in uh, 1905, actually, is kind of when you see the the rise of the, the movie theater uh, in America. That's from there. You can yeah. kind of chart the trajectory of moving the popularity pictures, of moving yes. pictures. Um, but, you know, opera houses had to do what they could to compete with that sort of up and coming new industry. Um, and I found this kind of this snippet from December of 1905, where the first motion motion picture films ever seen in Grand Island were actually at the the Barton Back Opera House. Uh-huh. It says these two Grand Islanders, Lloyd Kelly and Otto Nice, provided sound effects because they were they were silent films. Yeah. And to create those sound effects, they rustled tissue paper to s- simulate the sound of a waterfall, and they rattled sheets of tin to make the sound of thunder the first foley artists in grand island (laughs) yeah like i just think that's that that's so crazy to think about i mean it wasn't that long ago that that was happening no no 
Uh, and and Lloyd, to think Lloyd Kelly was was one of those. That was because uh, I believe that his family, they, there was some of them were lawyers and some of them were in the uh, plumbing business. Uh, but uh, that that's really interesting that they were already practicing those sound effects and, and all that. But I'm sure that, uh, some of those early movies came with instructions to insert music here and and all yeah, that. So I'm sure. I mean, they did what they could, mm-hmm. I, I think. But ultimately, the writing was on the wall. Um, yeah. By the 1920s, I think the jazz singer is the first mm-hmm. sound movie. Talk about a minstrel show. <laughs> right. That comes out in 1927. By that time, these traveling troops of performers are largely off the road and like yeah. the, a new age had begun. Uh, unfortunately, as technology evolved, this it's one of those things that just keeps happening. And opera houses ended up being the victims of that transition in technology. Fortunately for us, I think a lot of these buildings are still around. They have become different things over the years. and Yeah, a lot of them have been repurposed. I'm, I'm thinking of the one down in Red Cloud where they, they do some very successful things down there uh, associated with the Willa Cather uh, Foundation down there. Uh, there are others in, in other communities that have been saved, and some of the architecture on some of those opera houses is pretty stunning as well. Yeah, there's a, there's an opera house in Bruning, Nebraska still that's near Thayer County, I believe, mm-hmm. that uh, our museum actually purchased an artifact from because it's a, it's a large... It's a great piece of history. It's a large, probably five foot long sign that's made out of tin that just says Opera House 1907, Mm -hmm. which is the year that the Bruning Opera House was founded. Um, So we have that and it's going to be on display in this new exhibit that we're creating um, about about the Barton Back Opera House. I think people will be interested in seeing something like that and and some of the creativity and the way they were able to create signs and things is is kind of, it's tying some old technology to that, which is really kind of cool. Yeah, but like I, I, I made a phone call to the building that was still there and just kind of talked to the person who, you know, still administering over it. And essentially it's a town hall space yeah. that, you know, local civic functions take place in. Um, I'm sure there are other, you know, reasons for it to be rented out to community members. But yeah, I mean, it's still kind of functioning in that same way because, you know, in addition to entertainment, there were political speakers that would come by by rail to make their case during campaigns and, you know, like those community events, if, if something the, was going the, on. The town graduations. I, I exactly. can't tell you the number of times I've come across a, a something in the Grand Island newspaper that talks about the graduation that was going to take place at the uh, Barton Back. The GAR would use the Barton Back uh, on occasion to do some services some uh, for Memorial Day leading up to maybe the weather was poor and they would do a one part of their service at the Barton back. And then, then they would go to the cemetery to do the rest of the part of the service, depending upon what happened with the weather, but they would parade all the way from the Barton back opera house to the Grand Island city cemetery in order to, to complete all of this. Yeah. And we're, you know, we're, we're talking about all the great memories associated with this piece of American history, but unfortunately there are some more, uh, less savory details associated with not just the Barton Back Opera House in Grand Island, but opera houses nationwide. Yeah. Um, of course I'm referring to the more, let's just call it racist, uh, minstrel shows of, yes. of a bygone era. Are you familiar with, with some of those or with the uh, process a of few I've, I've, I've come across the advertisements in the Grand Island paper for some of the minstrel shows and some of those that included art, uh, in particular, uh, where they would, um, let's just say that the art was less than favorable, uh, if through mo- our modern eyes, the way we would see it would, would be considered offensive. Today. Yeah, stereotypical, yes. exaggerated imagery. Yes. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's a less than fortunate history, but you know it did happen. It was it's part of the it's part of the story. It's you know. But we 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 need to recognize that this was there, and that we and we acknowledge that it's not considered appropriate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
And it wasn't just, you know, one or two performances that were kind of one-offs. These were highly popular, you know, lucrative shows that... That traveled the entire country yeah. and were sold out houses all over the country. Yeah. And it's not just, you know, like they, like you said, there wasn't just one or two shows. There were literally entire troops who were known by, the, you know, they were known for doing these productions solely and made a living off of solely doing minstrel production and they would come to a community and sometimes they'd stay for a week or two weeks and put on a a matinee and an evening performance uh for one to two weeks of, of this so they would rake in the money from from all of that and then that was how they paid their troops and then they'd go on to the next community and do the same thing well fortunately i think we've all grown out of that as a culture and uh it's it's a much more enlightened period. Yes, I I think that it it is a part of our history. We need to 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 know about it and we need to to acknowledge it. Uh, but I don't think that we need to actually be recreating any of it. No, absolutely not. I mean, it, we are a, a cultural historic institution here mm -hmm. at Stern Museum, and it's our job to discuss. The past, whether that's comfortable or not. Yeah, all um, aspects of history. Uh, it, you can't ignore those bad parts because it's not all just about what the good stuff was. It is acknowledging that there was bad stuff as well. Yeah. To dovetail with that, uh, there there were people who were against opera houses in general. You know, they weren't and, just universally accepted. And were they? I, I have not run across that. So I'm interested to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah. And I, I'll, I, I will happily oblige you. I um, figured you probably would. So there's, there's sort of this long history that even dates back to before America was founded of people predominantly in like religious fundamentalism in, in America being mm -hmm. against Opera houses sort of in the same way that they're against gambling uh, or against like okay. animal fights yeah. like cockfighting yeah. and, and things like that. And they kind of get lumped in together, even to the point that in 1774, the Continental Congress banned by law theater productions. I have the, the text I here. I did not know that. That's interesting. The, the text of the law states from 1774 that we will in our several stations promote economy, frugality, and industry, and promote agriculture, arts, and the manufacturers of this country, especially that of wool. And we will discountenance and discourage every species of extravagance and dissipation, especially all horse racing, all kinds of gaming, cockfighting, exhibitions of shows, plays, and other expensive diversions and entertainments. <laughs> Emphasis given on towards the end there with those theatrical productions diversions and that, entertainments that yes. they will discountenance mm -hmm. fancy word for not allow yeah yeah so yeah I, I was i was really interested to come across that bit of history I, I i was not aware of it but but those sorts of things you see crop up in several early american colonies and then they're they're just they kind of get lumped into the the seedy underbelly of of other underworld activities like gambling, because as we were saying, there weren't like necessarily these highbrow operas taking yes. place in quotation marks, but but instead they were lighthearted comedies that might be, you know, poking fun at political leaders or d farcical recreations of certain events that might be taboo at the time. Oh, so and, and people uh, tend to enjoy when uh, political leaders are made fun of. And so I'm sure political leaders would probably not take too kindly to that. Exactly. And, and what kind of goes into this as well that I read is um, the, the banning of theater in, in this instance is really a sort of a, a jab to British authority. <laughs> um, Britain at the time is seen as the hub of culture. Yes. So in order to kind of snub them, why not ban their- We don't their, need that highbrow yeah, stuff. <laughs> we don't need your art form yeah. kind of kind mm -hmm. of a move there. And so, so that's, yeah, just a really unique well, bit of Well, it's interesting history. that horse racing is brought up because in the 19th century, when they start doing agricultural fairs, one of the in in Nebraska was one of them that it was not you were not supposed to gamble you weren't you weren't supposed to bet on horse races and they specifically named horse races and this is in the 19th century as but one of the popular things was 
horse racing mm. at agricultural fairs. And, un well, fortunately, unfortunately, depending upon how you look at it, people still bet on the horse races. Yeah. Because they weren't as formalized as they would be considered today. So, um, And listeners to our previous podcast on horse racing <laughs> will learn all about the gambling associated with it. Like, oh, shameless plug there. Shameless plug. Yeah. <laughs> but like, but even here when, um, you know, it's technically outlawed in 1774, that doesn't stop the likes of none other than George Washington allowing theatrical productions to take place while encamped. Uh, in 1778 in Valley Forge. Oh, no. <laughs> because in his mind, what else are these people supposed to do? I don't care if they want to make up their own stage productions, which they did. You've got to have some type of diversion because otherwise you'll go insane. Exactly. And that, and you see, that's what happened. And it was on both sides, I think, in both yeah. British and America. I mean, it's tough to remember this, but like warfare didn't take place year round. Yeah, it was kind of seasonal, sort of. And there was a whole bunch of downtime. It's like movie making. You know, people tend to think of it when, when they're making a movie uh, that everything's happening just all the time, but there's a whole lot of downtime and then these periods of activity and then more downtime. Yeah. Well, I kind of want to leave it there. Is there anything that we didn't hit that we should <sighs> consider hitting? I can't really... Uh, think of, uh, but the, the interesting thing about opera houses is that, yes, periodically, even the Barton Back had an opera. Yeah, that's so a good point. There were there even, you know, all these other types of productions and shows and musicals and all this stuff, other stuff occurred. They would still periodically have operas and uh, they would host people like the prima donna Clara Louise Kellogg to come and sing and she'd put on operatic performances. So yes, the highbrow stuff even made it to Grand Island. How many people uh, usually attend in those? I don't know. It doesn't say how many people attend. Usually the newspapers would wax poetic and, and say a large number of people attended last night's performance of whatever the show was and that it didn't matter what kind of show it was they would always report things along those lines i did i did come across in reading that uh, just like you were saying in some of those newspaper articles that they would say that you know they were expecting a grand attendance for such and such uh -huh. an event and it, it did not Right, raised to the level that they were expecting. Yeah, the the anticipation was high and the actuality was a little diminished. And that tended to happen with a lot of things. Yeah. And that's kind of what I'm curious about in terms of the, I, I mean, I know the which, which shows were popular and which ones were maybe less so. I'm sure there was well, always a you following. You know what we need? We need the books. We need the books from the Barton Back Opera House to see exactly how many people came here. Maybe they have the books that we could look up and say how many people attended. Wouldn't that be grand if there was a ledger book that said this performance and how many people came and to be able to look at all of the different names of the performances? Um, Funny enough, we actually do have that in our possession. Well, do tell. Yeah, uh... <laughs> So when we were fortunate enough to receive a donation from the Barton Back family, um, one of the things that, that came along with that donation was one of those ledgers from a year uh, in the 1890s. Oh, that it's would a, be fun to read. It's a very, very delicate um, yeah, it would be book fragile. that is not very easily uh, <laughs> to turn the pages of, and the cover is not in the best of shape, so we have yeah. not really... The paper of that period is real brittle. Beyond uh, conserving it, we have not um, spent a great deal of time in terms of actually researching the bottom lines Sounds spent like at the Opera House. needs to be a digital scan someday. Yeah, probably. Um, well, not probably. It definitely does. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I, I definitely saw that there were things like ballets that took place at mm -hmm. the Opera House as well and just kind of all manner of those more highbrow productions that we yeah, didn't talk it, about it, it was across the board and uh i there were even special performances during the week between christmas and new year's i remember seeing advertisements in the newspapers for that too so just once it would be fun to go see something along those lines see i it'd be really interesting to see a ballet 
performed. And I've never been upstairs in the old, I, I don't know very many people who have been upstairs in the old opera house because I know that it was, I think it was remodeled for offices and all that other sure. stuff. So the actual opera house part was taken apart. But I do think that there are pictures up, a, a few pictures of how the interior looked up there. And I, I think it would be, yeah, a little time traveling might be fun. It, it really must have been something. Yes. Um, Kay, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It's always, always a treat. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Stick with us, and we will be back with none other than George Bartonback, the descendant of the original Bartonbacks who founded and administered over the Bartonback Opera House. So stick with us, and we'll be back after these words. Today's podcast is brought to you by Amanda Glade Millinery and Dressmaking Shop. For the very finest in hats, dressmaking, and fancy goods, visit the Amanda Glade Millinery Shop on the northwest corner of Depot and North Front Street. Dressmaking by appointment only. Spring and fall openings a regular occurrence. Come get your new chapeau at Millinery and Dress Shop by Amanda Glade. Welcome back to the Stir Crazy Podcast. I am joined today with none other than George Bartonback of the Bartonback Opera House. George, thanks for being on the show. Sure. Uh, Sam, I know you wanted to uh, jump in and uh, introduce the the subjects we're going to be talking about and maybe something to do with the Stir Museum Foundation as well. Absolutely. So if any of you have not listened, my name is Sam Kazda. I'm the Foundation Giving Coordinator over here at the Stir Museum Foundation. Why I'm here, I don't necessarily have any of the history knowledge that Rob might have, but we do have the pleasure of working with um, George and Marla Barton back this year as the Stir Museum Foundation's 2021 Annual Fund Drive Chairs. Um, essentially what that means is we have um, the Barton backs and they're very passionate about this community. Um, they're well known in the community and they have ties here at store. And so they are kind of our um, forefront um, representation of what Stir Museum and the foundation do for the community um, here in Hall County and Grand Island. The Bartonbacks were deeply tied here in the community in Grand Island and still are, as I kind of mentioned with the annual fun drive campaign. Um, when did the family immigrate to the U.S. and where did they originate from, George? Well, George Bartonback was born in uh, Tootlingen, Württemberg, to Heinrich and Rosina Bartonback in 1844, uh, January 22nd to be exact. Heinrich was a tanner, and that was his trade, and that's what George was being trained to do. He got his journeyman's certificate in February of 1861 at the age of 17, and several months later he got his wonder book, which is what allowed them to uh, travel across the country and uh, work and travel and, and, and just see things. George left Germany in 1866. At the same time, he was there with his future wife at the same time, Charlotte Sievers. They arrived at the same time. We've never been sure if they met before they went on the boat to New York or if they met along the way. Uh, but after a couple of years, they were married. While in New York, George became, he worked several jobs, then he became a piano tuner and stringer for Steinway Piano, which was a very prestigious job at the time, tuned lots of pianos for local talent, and local stars, and was doing very well, but he always was wanting to do his own thing and be self-employed. So over those years, he worked at Steinway, some of the Seavers, Charlotte's parents, had moved to the Grand Island area, and they suggested that they come out because there was plenty of opportunity there. And so George and Charlotte moved their, themselves and their two sons to Grand Island and uh, started their own work there in business. Started their own opera house that went on to become the, the establishment that we're talking about today. He did a few other jobs in the meantime. He was a bricklayer, and he made bricks, and and quite a few different other jobs, but I think that was not uh, out of line at the time. So, George, what was the 
Barnback Opera House connection to the artist Grant Renard that, you know, Grand Island sort of claims as a native son. Grant's father's name was Stephen Renard, and he also had a brother named James Renard, and they both played in a band that frequented the Opera House. And, uh, and also Stephen helped Henry J. Barton back manage the Opera House from 1883 to 1894. So basically, Grant Bernard grew up in the Opera House. Yeah. Uh, always heard stories about him running around and sketching people and sketching things, and that's what he grew up to be famous for. Sure. So it was uh, a lot of a lot of things. In uh, he said, the late Grant Gennard, nationally acclaimed artist who was born and raised in Grand Island, had found youthful memories of attending productions at the Barton Beck Opera House, where his father served as manager. Grant said once, "I knew the Opera House was make believe in earnest, but weren't we all acting, all of us, around the town each day?" Very well said. The museum actually has a few photos of Grant Renard posing in the Barton Back Opera House in our collection. And they're they're really great to see. You can tell that he it's a, it's a place that he really cared about, and Grand Island as a whole is a place that he returned to throughout his life. And he always said that he wished to be depicted as a Nebraskan. Didn't have to do that, but you know he was true to his native home, and you know upheld the the Grand Island community whenever he could. Yep. All right, George. So it kind of sounds like the Opera House was not only an opera house. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what other businesses were housed in this building over the years and when those other businesses kind of began to develop? Well, I personally, I can't speak for a lot of these businesses uh, by looking at the pictures of all the different time periods that we have. You can see that there was cigar and billiard place there and of course the paint store took up the second bay there there was a clothing stores there was uh used to be a pharmacy there in the middle of the building when i was a kid uh, made the best strawberry malt malt you ever had yeah and it was walklands and there was shoe repair place that was marlar's and of course we've had a gift store a card store uh, the art gallery, glass and paint, and, and all of those. So I think there's just been a just a constant procession. I think that's probably what what George was thinking when he put the opera house up above is that the the bottom stores would always be for sale or at, for rent, and that would keep cash flow going. Yeah, and because uh, when you do a step out there and do an opera house. You're not really sure about what the future is going to bring and not being a, a tested business at that time and not knowing who you were going to be able to attract for shows. You knew you could take advantage of some of the local uh, things and shows, but to try and do what they did, in fact, and pull people from all across the country to come through the shows, yeah, they couldn't have that crystal ball to know they were going to make that. So I think that was probably one of George's reasoning for having those different bays in there so that they could always change and evolve and, and become other businesses as others failed. Yeah, when I was uh, I was doing some research, just what, what I could find with local articles, it said that it's always referred to as the Bartonback Block. It was never really referred to as the Bartonback Opera House, and it's because there was essentially six different storefronts at, at any one time. And uh, this one that I happened across was talking about George Barton back in the 1880s, and it said that it was Barton back paints, oils, glass, wallpaper, window shades, toys, notions, etc. <laughs> and like, I mean, I think that just about says it all. Uh, and then, like, you have the opera house on the second floor, right. but everything else, yeah, along the main floor as well. That was pretty crazy. One of the spaces I know that was right next to the stairways go upstairs and downstairs on on that uh, west exposure there. But then one of the stores that was there a long time was the concession. And yeah. obviously that's where you would buy, you know, a pop or, or candy or whatever. Of course, if you get that kind of people going to a theater or something. Now we take it for granted we're going to buy a candy bar and a, and a bag of uh, popcorn. But then a, for I'm not 19 sure what the heck. <laughs> <Yeah>, exactly. <laughs> 
No, uh, one of the other items that we have in the exhibit is a uh, is a doll from when it was you know a storefront that sold toys, mm-hmm. and I had no idea that that was one of the things they did. I thought maybe it was you know part of the theater that there was some kind of a novelty store that they might have sold to children. But yeah, I guess it was actually a store for dolls and, dolls toys. and toys like that. Yeah, we have we've had a lot of businesses ourselves, but I know that uh, just in the last. 25 years, we've had uh, at least a half a dozen different businesses, just because a lot of times the downtown and those spaces have been transient. Now it seems like they're a little, a little more sediment. Now they're they're set a little bit more, and of course, downtowns have had good days and bad, so businesses do move around. You mentioned the, you know, kind of the traveling shows being kind of there almost as like a a feather in the hat, you know, like the, the businesses are what needed to make the money. And like the opera house was something that, you know, you couldn't really necessarily rely on. Do you know what were the, were the shows that did take place in the opera house? Were they primarily, you know, traveling shows or were they more, you know, local performances or was it, was it kind of just a little bit of everything? I think there were a little bit of everything. I I know that especially Henry J. uh, Barton back really, took the opera house bull by the horns and there we I've just found hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters to shows from New York and Chicago and and the Denver and, and all of these areas. And he was always reaching out to other people and other shows and saying, hey, well here we are, you know, you're gonna be traveling to Denver Denver from Chicago or vice versa. And so they he was always trying to get people to come here for the shows. But I know that there was high school graduations there. Yeah. There were proms there for locals. And so I think being the smart businessman that he was, that he always just tried to keep the place as full as he could, keep things rolling. And because uh, back in that time, I think one time I said, you know, you, they were getting from a dime uh, a person to one of the most expensive shows was 50 cents a person. Yeah. Uh, that was a lot of money for them back sure. then. So I'm sure whatever he needed to do to keep that ball rolling and keep the place active is what he did. Yeah. I was, I kind of looked in there was a, uh, it was kind of a meeting house too, for some of the more like theatrical productions that were happening in town as well. Like, like the Sanger fest was hosted one year at the leader crans, like in the 1880s. Yep. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of, performance-based things like that took place there as well. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, well, I think if you've got a place in town that has a stage and the seating and all of that, it's going to get used because there aren't that many places to choose from. Another item or several items that we'll have in the exhibit is kind of what you were talking about, that correspondence. Your One of your relatives, I'm not sure you know which George or which Henry kept it or maybe multiple did, but um, there's just volumes of documents that are from this little tiny theater and this little tiny theater and this correspondence back and forth between directors, you know, kind of, you know, whether it's an agent on behalf of an actor or actress, or it's the actual proprietor of the theater itself. It's really amazing to see like how many theaters were, you know, just kind of dotting the countryside between the coasts. And yeah, that's a great piece of history that I don't think a lot of people know about. Oh, that's he's, I just, it's really cool to look at some of those letterheads too. Yeah. They're really fancy and really stand out. Tons and tons of, uh, of correspondence between them. And then there's always the contracts that they're coming up with so much money for how long they're going to stay here. And I don't think most of the traveling acts stayed overnight. They would ne- normally come in in the afternoons and then do their performance, one or two performances. And, and then get on the train and move on during the night. I remember a story about Henry not getting paid for one of those shows and having to go to another town to track the, uh, the troop down to make sure that he got his payment. And uh, I guess I, I, I thought they would have collected that money, but it was always said that uh, Henry Jar- J. Barton back never got to bed ever before two o'clock in the morning. Wow! Because they take all the proceeds, they count everything out and whatever the the deal was, and 
and then they'd settle up and, and then that was when their day was done. So hours were not something that they watched the clock very much of. No, I, I, I can see why. Um, we were kind of talking briefly before the podcast about uh, notable performances that probably took place at the Barton Back Opera House. I know you weren't there for them, but uh, were there any you know stories of family lore that of, of shows that that took place there back in the day? You know, I guess I don't really remember a whole lot of, sh- of stories about that. I know there were several shows that uh, appeared several times, several troops that would come with one show in particular or another, and so they would play multiple times, and some had really good turnouts and uh, and some of them didn't. I know that uh, Al Jolson played the piano that is still in the display probably, and yeah. we had used it through our whole lives. Parents had it, then we had it, and then we brought it down to the store and used it. I had it. Somebody must have stomped on the keys or something like one of the kids and broke some heads. And uh, so I had a guy come and fix it all up, and, and then we had it played a lot of times at some of our art shows. Yeah, we have it. It was a real joy to move that into place where it still sits right now because that thing was made to last. It was. Yes. Um, you know, it's, I feel like I, not that I ever would, but if I put my shoulder into it, I don't think it would move and my shoulder would. <laughs> would. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was a, that's a quality piano that we're going to have there on exhibit. The, some of the, some of the performances that I came across when I was doing research myself were, you know, there's some, there's some big names. Um, Al Jolson is one that I came across and a couple others were uh, Sarah Bernhardt. The actress was Mm -hmm. someone who performed there. Um, John Philip Sousa, the conductor, you know, and, and that orchestra that he represented played there, you know, Buffalo Bill Cody, you know, these are nationally renowned names that came to Grand Island, Nebraska because it was the place to be during that time. I, I find that to be pretty cool and pretty important to this area. So uh, we kind of talked briefly about the uh, the exhibit that's coming to the to the Stir Museum. It's going to feature the entire Barton Back family legacy. We hope um, our Stir Museum curatorial staff has a unique relationship with the Barton Back family, and that he allowed us to uh, to come on a donation to the the side of the Opera House last summer. And we we were we kind of scouted that location for this exhibit ahead of time and we came away with some with some great pieces of history and i was just curious if there was anything that you're hoping to see in this exhibit that'll tell that story effectively in the exhibit well the piano is one of the things that we've had in our family for years and it's just been their staple uh, my parents had it in their house and, and we even had to take apart a staircase to get it down in their basement and then uh when they wanted to get rid of it, we took it into our house, and the kids learned how to play piano on that. And then they were, when they were done with it and had, had moved out, we brought it down to the store and had some shows, art shows, and we had somebody play piano several times. And every once in a while, I'd have some kid or somebody come in the store and just sit down and start playing it. And I'd go, who is that? And I'd go <laughs> in and just introduce myself and say hi. And they said, do you mind if I play your piano? And I said, Nope, that's what it's there for. Yeah. So uh, I'm yeah, I'm really happy to see that in the display. Also, the flag, I think, that was one of the big surprises out of all your work. Yeah. Uh, is an amazing artifact there. And 1876 flag and, and the 16 foot by 8 foot. I think we were all just... <laughs> yeah, waiting for it to mouths end. Open. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just as we were unrolling it, when does this end? Because it just took for a couple of minutes to unroll it all the way. And it's lucky we had that space even to yeah. unroll it. Yeah. I think uh, both of us were kind of really surprised from the outcry of the community of the like local press who was interested in it. It was a 38 star flag from 38. 1877, I believe. North Dakota or South Dakota was that, that time period, I believe. Yeah. I, I, I looked into that um, <laughs> right afterwards and I think it's seared into my head, but um. 38 star flag came into being because of uh, Colorado. Um, but then the the next flag that came out was the 43 star flag in 1890. And that had the additions of North Dakota, South Dakota, like you were saying, um, Montana, Washington, and Idaho. Right. 
But yeah, that, that'll be on display and it'll be a sight to see right when you walk in the, the Fauna Rotunda building that we have here, that's for sure. I think the, the a lot of the artifacts, like you had said, the, all the letterheads and all the letters and and uh, I had somebody tell me once I sh- that people like to buy those to do art on and things like that. And I said, no, I think <laughs> these belong in a museum. Yeah. And so I'm glad to see that people are going to have a lot to look at there. And I'm not even sure what kind of uh, artifacts you're going to use from the Barton Back paint store. And uh, But there's a lot of good old tools there that were used and and things like they, when they used to, make the paint they literally made the paint they didn't come in yeah. a can you throw a little tinning unit in there or, or some uh, tinning colors and boom here you got the color you want and you actually started from scratch with that can and add the oils and the lead and the colorant and all of that so it was uh, quite a quite a deal to do that in the oils yeah we've uh, we've got all that stuff in our collections building and uh, it's been used you know and it looks it there's a uh, you know, old jugs of linseed oil and uh, different sorts of uh, toner and names that I can't pronounce. And But it's your brand. It says it right on there. There's a Barton Back Galleries label that, that says it on there. And that it's just, there's history all over it because there's paint dripping down the sides of it. And it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty neat to see. And, you know, like these old funnels that are, you know, still stuck in the bottles themselves. And, you know, it was a, it was a mom and pop homespun operation. And it, it's really great. And I think that's what kind of happened after uh, Henry J got old enough where there's more of a transition where George took care of the business. George Sr. took care of the paint store primarily and Henry J spent more time on the opera house because he couldn't have hardly done it all at the same time. Yeah. And uh, of course there was always uh, the painter that had come in and ordered the paint and while they, uh, while they were mixing the paint, George would take them across the street to the bar and they'd have a beer. Yeah. Sounds like a way to do business to me. Why, why not? Like, it ain't broke. <laughs> That's right. Um, what is, I got to ask you, what's, and I don't know, what's the story of the, do you know of the, the George following Henry, following George, following Henry and how that kind of started? Or was it, I'm sure it wasn't planned. Maybe that's just how it happened. I guess there's nothing that uh, made it happen. I think they, Sons, all, a lot of times, honor their fathers by naming their, their children. And I know that George had three boys while they were in New York. And one of them was Henry J. And the other one was George. And he only, he only lived for about a month. And so he named them both his father's name and his name after him. And so it just always kind of went down the, the line from there, George Henry, George, Henry, George. And, gotcha. And uh, so we just kind of made it stick. Seemed like the right thing to do. Yeah, it worked out for sure. Well, George, I think that's all the, the questions I have for you. I just wanted to thank you for stopping by. And uh, thanks for allowing us to present your family legacy in this exhibit. Sure. My pleasure. All right, stick with us and we will be back after these words. That's going to do it for this week's episode on the Stuart Crazy podcast dealing with opera houses. I know I had a great time with this one. Yeah, that one was really interesting. There's a lot of history, a lot of uh, a lot of really great stuff, and George was great to talk to. We're moving from something this week that's very Grand Island specific to something very Nebraska specific next week, and that is the... Uh, we're doing the history of the Runza, guys. This will be fun. Yeah, Runza restaurants in general. I, I'm, I can't wait to really dive into the history of this one because... Uh, maybe whether or not you know it, Runza has impacted your life in more ways uh, than maybe you care to realize. Like from everything from like the rock and roll Runza restaurant to the sandwich itself to Temperature Tuesdays and all those sorts of things that have kind of made their way into our lives. I'm I'm definitely interested to uh, talk about the history of some of those. Yeah, me too, because it's kind of like our Skyline Chili or our, you know, New York pizza or whatever it is that defines, you know, the cuisine that design defines where you are. And of course, we're going to talk about the history of it, but that's next week. So come back and uh, we we will uh, be talking to Renza next week on the Stuart Crazy Podcast. Absolutely. We'll be bringing it to you next week. Oh, all right. We'll see you then. <laughs>